Welcome to To the Foothills, a Colorado lifestyle and real estate podcast featuring mountain home real estate broker Robert Martin, who has over 25 years of experience assisting clients reach their goals and move forward. Tune in each week for a dynamic conversation with experts, Colorado adventurers, and residents that explores the ins, outs, and specific nuances of buying the perfect mountain home or selling your dream home in Evergreen, Conifer, Bailey, and surrounding areas to catch a glimpse into the Colorado lifestyle that's a part of you. Thanks for tuning in today. Our guest on the podcast today is Scott Fitzke. Scott is with Short Ridge and Fitzke. He's an attorney. You do a lot of real estate as well. And I just wanted to say thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Yes, Robert, thank you for having me. I'm excited about it and I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, you bet. My pleasure. So tell me about yourself and your background, Scott. Sure. Well, I'm a Colorado native. I was born in Denver, um, although we moved around a lot when I was young. And so I think before I was in the sixth grade, I lived in Denver, Farmington, New Mexico, Salt Lake City, San Diego, Grand Island, Nebraska, and Hastings, Nebraska. So I had moved probably 10 or 11 times before I was in junior high school. I'm a Colorado native, but I was raised in South Central Nebraska primarily. So I think of myself as a Nebraskan at heart. So yeah, and uh, I'm married. I've been married for 33 years. My wife is a, a IT director at Gates Corporation. I've got a 29 year old son who is a sound and recording engineer. And my 26 year old daughter just got her real estate broker license. So oh boy. <laughs> she's starting out in the winter time during a pandemic when there's no inventory. <laughs> <laughs> boy, so true. Well, yeah. you'll have some, um, some good insights for her, certainly sure. your background in real estate, but it is a different time out there and inventory is even tighter than last year. So, yeah. um, so talk about your areas of expertise. Sure, sure. So our primary area of expertise is matters, all matters involving real estate. One of our primary areas of practice is we represent the top real estate brokerages in Colorado, and we represent the most successful real estate brokers in Colorado. And it's really a pleasure for us to serve the brokerage community. We get to work with a lot of really fun and successful people. So we love that part of our business. Our practice is probably about 70% litigation and 30% transactional work. In addition to representing the brokerage community, we represent buyers, sellers, developers, contractors, property managers, uh, landlords, property management companies, fix and flip investors, and uh, I also represent a lot of boutique lenders as well. So on the litigation side, we do a lot of insurance defense work, and we do a lot of title work involving real estate title issues. And we pretty much handle any kind of a dispute involving real estate, like quiet title actions, boundary disputes. We do commercial and investor foreclosures. We represent creditors in bankruptcies, and we represent quite a few contractors and subcontractors as well. Um, well, you guys do a, a wonderful job and certainly have a sterling reputation. And uh, have, um, with my experience with my past brokerage, uh, you were there to assist and, and to provided some, some great guidance. Yeah, so, yeah. Scott, when we move forward, I know that um, with um, buying property in the mountain area, it's a little different with some of the complexities with things. When purchasing a, a mountain home, what do you think the buyer's due diligence is regarding easements and survey matters and just other things that may arise? Sure, sure. And we see a lot of issues with easements, boundaries, roadways, and mountain property transactions. And they come up more often in homes that have not been recently platted as part of a subdivision. So we're looking at, you know, homes that have been around uh, since, say, before 
built prior to maybe 1990 or so. We see a lot more issues with those uh, and a lot less issues in formal subdivisions. To answer your question regarding what a buyer's due diligence obligations are, I think there's two really important obligations with respect to potential boundary and easement issues. The first is to carefully review the title commitment. And the title commitment should show any recorded documents that affect the title to the property. So they would show recorded easements, land use agreements, uh, restrictive covenants, and things like that. Uh, It's important with mountain property to carefully review the easements and make sure that a potential, an easement doesn't interfere with the potential intended use of the property. So that's number one. Number two, unless the property is in a recently platted subdivision and it looks very clear that there aren't gonna be any issues, we recommend that the buyer obtain a survey of the property before they uh, close the transaction. And the contract, the standard contract that we use in Colorado provides for the assignment of whose responsibility the survey is and who pays for the survey. So typically, if you're representing a buyer, you would ask the seller, one, to provide copies of any existing surveys they have. And then two, if if there isn't an existing survey or if a lender is calling for a new survey, uh, you know, obviously if I was representing the buyer, I'd ask the seller pay for a new survey. The seller would want the buyer to pay for that. That's something that can be negotiated, but it is really important to get a survey. And a survey, a formal boundary survey is different from an improvement location certificate. In an improvement location certificate has good practical uses, but it doesn't really present the level of protection for a buyer that a formal survey would do. Um, That's a good point, Scott. It seems that uh, there is um, certainly a big difference in that. And I would assume that if you're advising a client, the more detail you can get, probably the better. Absolutely, absolutely. And so a survey would show any potential encroachments of the improvements of the subject property on a neighbor's land. It would also show any potential encroachments of the, of the neighbor's improvements on the property that's being purchased. And so there's issues that can come up on both sides of that. And a survey would show that. Where we typically see issues is with driveways, retaining walls, fences. Uh, I had one recently where there was a pond that was straddling the property line a little bit uh, that was claimed ownership of the pond and the water rights to the pond were, were claimed by the person selling the property. And one of the neighbors was raising an issue that, that they actually had acquired some kind of a right to the pond. And then in mountain, mountain properties, especially in areas where the the lot isn't flat. We see building encroachments sometimes where part of a garage or part of a shed is on the neighbor's property or vice versa. And so a survey would show all of that. And that way the buyer can determine if they want to purchase the property at all. And the buyer and seller, if if the buyer wants to go forward, can work out some kind of an arrangement to address those issues. Another... Go ahead. Go ahead Scott. Yeah. yeah, no, you go ahead. I was yeah, just going to so, say that that's, that's real important, but it, uh, what are the other important factors? So Yeah. And another thing we see a lot, and I'm sure you've seen this, Robert, with your experience in, in acting as a real estate broker for mountain properties is, especially in certain areas of Jefferson County, the road beds do not lie within, <laughs> they're not where they're supposed to be. And we see a lot of issues where, you know, the road is shown, uh, you know, on the public records as being in a certain location and it's not really there. And so a survey would show that there's obviously ways you can address all those issues. But the important thing 
in the due diligence process is to identify them so the buyer can make a good decision about whether they want to go forward and purchase the property. For sure, for sure. And it, the importance of doing your due diligence um, you know, far exceeds just doing the home inspection. You know, you have the opportunity to, and the contract lays it all out um, with the dates and the due diligence dates to follow those and make sure that, uh, that you have the opportunity to do all the inspections and your due diligence. And when it comes to filling out the seller's property disclosure, which is something the seller does uh, prior to a contract, how best should a seller go about filling that out? Sure. Can I jump back to the to the uh, survey and I just oh, have one more due you diligence bet. piece of advice for a buyer. You bet, you bet. Is take the survey and walk the property mm. and see where the surveyor is showing the boundaries of the property. And just take a physical look at the building envelope, the roads, the driveways, compare it to the survey. And just make sure that you're satisfied that everything is as you as you want it to be. Um, and then Great idea. If you'll identify any issues. You should have your real estate broker address those issues with the, with the other broker and consult with legal counsel if need be. Great idea. Yeah. Cause you can visually walk it and sometimes you'll maybe discern some things that aren't in writing and uh, that's great. Plus it also gives you a good idea of where your pro property line is. Absolutely. Um, you know, it depends upon, you know, what you're purchasing doesn't matter if it's an acre or, or 40 acres. It's, it's really nice to know and have, have that uh, orientation. So yeah. good point. True. True. So the seller's property disclosure. So the contract requires that the seller provide a seller's property disclosure filled out to the best of their current actual knowledge. The parties have the right to amend the contract and provide that a seller's property disclosure will not be provided. Obviously, we don't recommend that, but that comes up primarily in sales where the seller uh, didn't ever actually reside at the property. So for example, a sale by an estate of a decedent where the personal representative is one of the children or whatever, and they're selling the property and they don't really have personal knowledge about the property. So there's some instances when it's okay. Uh, a bank owned transaction would be another one where uh, the seller's property disclosure wouldn't be that helpful. But from the seller's standpoint, if you're selling a property that you actually lived in or that you owned for a long time, you should fill out a seller's property disclosure completely and accurately based upon your current knowledge. And it's really important to take time and answer the, all of the questions as best you can. Um, Sometimes that involves going back into your personal records and looking at receipts and invoices and work that you've done on the property uh, so that you can give the buyer an accurate picture of any potential issues with the property. One of the primary areas of litigation that we handle is disputes over whether disclosures were made properly. And so, and they can be expensive stressful, time-consuming. They can cause a lot of havoc in your life. And so we recommend that it's just better to over-disclose than it is to under-disclose and to provide accurate information. Another issue that we see come up once in a while is it's fairly typical for a seller to fill out a seller's property disclosure form at the time that they list the property for sale with their broker. And once in a while, there's an intervening event from the time that the seller's property disclosure is filled out and the closing. And so if something like that happens, for example, a hailstorm damages the roof or, or something like that, uh, the seller should amend or supplement the seller's property disclosure form. Um, Great point. Yeah. And then one other thing I would add is, is if you're a buyer, a seller's property disclosure form is not a substitute for having the property inspected by an inspector. So 
Um, it's <clears throat> good to have, but you really need to be responsible for your own inspection of the property. Yeah, great point. I mean, certainly can uh, review that and interpret it and certainly uh, talk to your broker, also talk to an attorney uh, if they have, want any feedback on the disclosure, but you also want to do your due diligence and do your inspections. And uh, since we do have a lot of water wells up here, Scott, what is the proper use of a water well per the well designation uh, from the Colorado Division of Water Resources? I know there's a few different designations that we see. Uh, and then some people um, at times have animals and maybe they don't have the proper designation. Uh, for the, or at least the well doesn't have that proper designation. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me start real generally and then I'll drill down on this specific question. So water law in Colorado is very complex. Colorado has a relatively unique system of providing for the administration of water rights. And those administrative provisions apply to both groundwater and to uh, tributary water. And again, because it's so complex, there's a lot of different types of well permits. There's exemptions from well permits. There's regulations that have different requirements based upon the size of the property. But in general, for a typical single family residence that's being purchased, it's located in the mountains, there's two types of permissible uses that would be allowed uh, by the state for a particular well. And the well permit itself will designate what the permissible uses are. And so it's important as a part of the due diligence process to get a copy of the well permit so that you can review it. In general, these particular permits will allow for either household use of the well water or domestic and livestock use of the well water or both. So some wells have rights to use the water for both domestic and uh, agricultural purposes. So the permissible use of the well is limited by law to what the water permit allows. Household use is defined as use inside of a single family residence for the water that a normal family uses for cooking, cleaning, washing, things like that. Um, and for the, obviously for their drinking water. Uh, so that's household use. Household use does not allow you to use your well water for irrigation, watering your lawn, or watering livestock. Domestic use allows for irrigation of your lawn and garden, and it allows for use of your water for individual domestic animals and livestock. Uh, so those are the two primary distinctions that would come up in a normal transactions. Um, it's fairly typical to see a well permit that was originally uh, granted for domestic use that was subsequently modified to allow for household use. So that's something that we see quite frequently. When you're buying a property that has a well, you should get a copy of the well permit if there is one. If there isn't one, you need to consult with an expert and find out if the well needs to be permitted before the property uh, transaction closes and uh, or find out if it's perhaps exempt from the permitting requirement. Yeah, you want to make another, sure that it's proper for uh, what you want to use it for. Absolutely. And another thing that we recommend is just talk to the seller, um, ask them how old the well is, find out if it's permitted. Um, and then, you know, if the seller doesn't have the data, the state water engineer's office should have all of that data. So if the well was drilled in the last probably 40 years and it was, it was legally drilled, the state water engineer's office should have the documents showing the history of the well and what it was approved for. Um, the buyer should get the well permit and make sure that the permissible use that's granted by the state fits their intended uses. Uh, another thing that a buyer should look at is sometimes well permits have expiration dates. And so a buyer should look at that and 
you what you want to try to avoid is having the, the permit expire in between the time that you do the contract and when you do the closing because that just throws another wrinkle into a transaction. If, if the renewal date is coming up relatively quickly, the seller should go ahead and renew it before the closing. If it's after the closing, the buyer can usually handle that without any issues. Scott, would that mainly be a well that has not been drilled that would expire, or could that actually be on existing as, as well? Um, it primarily comes up with wells that have not been dug, but we have seen them on occasions with existing permits where they have expiration dates. Okay. Something to certainly be mindful of because it's, yeah. I would say 75% of the properties in the foothills do have wells. There are some, some water systems, some small public and private water systems. Um, so Scott, if, um, what are the primary responsibilities uh, for a real estate broker when working with buyers and sellers in Colorado in a nutshell? Sure. The, it's hard that's to a kind of a big question. <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. Let me I guess approach you can't put it in a nutshell, but a real estate broker representing a buyer. And then I'll talk about a real estate broker representing a seller. Okay, great. Thanks. And so I and I know that we have the relatively new situation where uh, people are buying properties off of the internet. I've got some where people have bought houses sight unseen based upon, you know, things that they saw in one of the one of the commercial like Zello or Redfin or one of those things. And, you know, I'm a pretty traditional guy, but I'm also a lawyer and I see the fallout from people not using a licensed professional to help them buy or sell property. And so, you know, to me, in the big picture of things, the small savings that you might get by trying to use one of those websites to buy a property, uh, they don't offset uh, the value that you get from using a real estate broker. So a buyer's broker would help you find a suitable property. And right now with the market the way it is, that's a huge job. And having a professional do that for you is it's invaluable because you just, you know, they have resources that are available that normal lay people don't have. And so that's one of the one of the main advantages that having a, a broker represent you when you're a buyer. Uh, another important thing is, an aspect, again, with our market, the way it is with, you know, people, uh, sellers receiving numerous offers on a property, people offering more than the listing price, uh, people uh, making offers with appraisal gap coverage. A real estate broker can help the buyer determine whether to make an offer and what the amount of the offer should be and communicate with the listing broker about that. Whereas if you're trying to to do something on your own or using a website, you're really working in the dark and you don't have the value of that broker's expertise. Um, real estate brokers will write the contract. Uh, they'll advise you about any items that they think uh, require the assistance of an expert or legal counsel. And, you know, typically- um, How well, often- just, how about this, Scott? Do you think a real estate attorney should review a contract? Um, obviously, when there's something that the broker feels like they should, or it could be in every every situation, I guess, uh, you know, have a legal counsel have another set of eyes looking at it. Yeah. Well, you know, at the top of the contract, there's a warning that it's it's a contract <laughs> and that you should have legal counsel review it. And obviously, as attorneys, we would love to review every single real estate contract that's done, but that's, it's not practical and it's not necessary in every transaction. I mean, if it's a pretty straightforward transaction and you're using the Colorado Real Estate Commission approved forms, there isn't really a need for an attorney to look, look at the contract before you submit it. The forms have been vetted by the Real Estate Commission Forms Committee for years and years and years. And some of the top real estate minds are on that committee. They're very comprehensive. 
they're not one-sided. So they're designed to provide protection both to buyers and sellers. So I personally don't think that a buyer needs to have a real estate contract reviewed by an attorney. The only caveat is if there are special additional provisions. So things that are agreed upon between the buyer and seller that are outside of the language of the contract. And I do recommend that you either have an attorney draft the additional provisions or you have an attorney review the additional provisions. Now, some brokerages, and for example, Compass is one of the brokerages, um, they have retained legal counsel to draft template additional provisions that are designed for particular situations. It's fine to use those if they fit if they fit the transaction. And so, you'd be talking specifically, Scott, about in this market you mentioned earlier uh, with your daughter starting out, and we're seeing a lot of um, appraisal gap protection. People are waiving inspections. Um, they're making earnest money go um, non-refundable with contract in order to be competitive in the marketplace. So those are the yeah. types of clauses you're referencing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are situations where the buyer should be extra diligent. For sure. Yep. Um, to shift gears just a bit, why is it important for homeowners to do estate planning? It goes hand in hand, obviously, with buying real estate, but there's a lot more to it than, um, you know, just buying, you know, it's kind of laying out the whole whole schematic for, for what you're looking like financially. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, estate planning is really important and it's really important for everyone. And estate planning, most people think of a will or trust. But there's other documents that should be included with an estate plan. And so you should have a will or a trust that provides for the disposition of your property. It's also important that you have medical and financial powers of attorney so that if you were to become unable to make decisions for yourself, that you've designated an agent that could make those decisions for you. Um, Another thing we recommend is a medical declaration, and the layperson's term for that is a living will. And that is the document where you tell your family and your representatives and your doctors how you want end of life medical decisions to be made. And so, you know, what kind of artificial life preservation uh, is acceptable for you based on your personal beliefs. And then another thing that's important with estate planning that most people don't think of is because of the restrictions on physicians, uh, because of the HIPAA requirements, technically a physician doesn't have the legal authority to communicate with your family about your medical condition. And so we also recommend that you have a HIPAA waiver so that your medical uh, professionals can communicate with your family about decision. Uh, the reason why it's important to have a will, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. The state has fallback uh, provisions about appointing personal representatives and about the disposition of property. If you don't have a will, one of the main reasons to have a will or trust is to avoid probate. And if you fall back on what the statutes allow, you're going to end up at a minimum with an informal probate and potentially a formal probate. One of the main goals in estate planning is to avoid probate. Um, another goal is to allow you to have control over your disposition of your property and the appointment of your fiduciaries instead of having a, a court or a court administrator make those decisions. Estate planning allows you to, to plan for unforeseen circumstances. And so, you know, it's a typical uh, mindset when you're younger that, uh, that you can wait. And, you know, and a lot of people do wait and they address their estate planning in their informative years. And having estate planning documents in place now allows you to plan for unforeseen events, because even if you're young and healthy, you could be in an accident and have a brain injury or something like that. And so it's a really good idea to do it as early on. Um, something you'd want to do sooner than later and 
I assume it's something that your firm does. Um, Absolutely. You know, yeah. maybe putting real estate in a trust or a family trust or, or whatever, but certainly making that transition uh, simpler for those left behind uh, in eliminating probate. Yep. And a couple other things, just briefly. If you have minor children or special needs children, um, having estate planning is especially critical because you want to be able to control how your children are being taken care of. And you certainly don't want a court or a court administrator making the decision about who's going to care for your children. Typically, if you have minor children or special needs children, you would provide for the appointment of a guardian and conservator for them in your estate planning documents. And then the last thing, and you kind of just briefly touched on that, is estate planning can assist in providing limitation of liability uh, with real estate. And it can also provide for protection of your assets from creditors. And so those things enter into estate planning as well. Yeah, great points. And I, you know, my wife and I have done that recently and uh, made that, uh, made those decisions moving forward. But like you said, Scott, it's something that you could do at a much younger age. And you know, at least get some in, valuable information about what that looks like, you know, as you continue to move forward and you know, get married, have children, you add assets to your portfolio. Um, so probably, this, you know, like you said, sooner the better, even if they, I would assume, don't proceed, at least they have information and they could possibly make some decisions to proceed sooner than later. So yeah, great absolutely. Stuff. Yep. So Scott, being from Denver, being from the area or, or well, not from, I know you moved a lot, but uh, living here quite a while. What are some of the, your favorite things you like to do? And what's, what would you say you like most about living in the, the foothill area? Yeah, well, we, we do a lot of outdoor recreation. Um, we've got a motor home. We like to hike, camp, uh, ride ATVs, things like that. And the proximity of the foothills area to those Colorado amenities is one of the things that really, we really like. You know, I like the fresh air and I like the, uh, uh, the views and the ambience of being close to the, close to the mountains. And, uh, you know, this, we live in, in Ken Carl Ranch and Ken Carl has great amenities. And so that's another thing that we really like about being in the foothills. And the people, I think that the, I just, I fit in a little bit better with the foothills and mountain crowd than I do with the urban dwellers. So I feel more at home. <laughs> <laughs> You're a Midwest boy. I, you know, I, I grew up in exactly. Kansas in a small town. So um, there's some good folks. I mean, the Midwest folks are great. Not that other people aren't, but uh, real yeah. good, uh, real good starting point. So um, I appreciate all your information, Scott. It's been wonderful. And if you were going to just say just a couple tidbits of advice for somebody purchasing a home in the mountains, I know you've gone over some great things with due diligence and, and that sort of thing. What might that be or just a couple things? Yeah, well, you know, have a good contract, do your due diligence, and the due diligence goes beyond what we've talked about today. We don't have enough time today to talk about of all of the due diligence obligations, but the contract lays them all out and sets forth deadlines for the seller to provide information and for the buyer to review it and object to it. That's the most important thing. Yeah, that and you know, and like you said, there is a schematic with all the dates in the contract that lays it out to do your due diligence in a timely manner, and you have certain rights and obligations in that contract. So, like you said, you can follow that and and make sure that uh, you're up to speed on you know, everything that you need to be doing and, and, and doing your due diligence. So where can people go, Scott, to find out about you if they'd like to? Yeah, sure. So our website is www.fsmlaw.net. And it has our bios and the bios of my partners and our contact information. So that would be a good place to start. Okay, great. Well, we really appreciate your time. It's been very, uh, very insightful. And I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to visit with us today. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I just want to say I really appreciate you having me on your program.
I hope that I was able to provide some useful guidance to sellers and buyers of mountain properties and uh, just throw in a, a marketing plug that we're able to assist your viewers if they have a need for legal counsel when they're purchasing a mountain property. No, that's great. And it's, it's always good to, to have uh, that type of referral. So thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, thank you too. It's good to see you again too, by the way. Yeah, good to see you too, Scott. Thanks. To the Foothills, a Colorado lifestyle and real estate podcast. On the podcast, I interview real estate experts, Colorado adventurers, and residents who enjoy the serenity and lifestyle of living in our mountain communities. Tune in each week for a conversation that explores the ins and outs of buying the perfect mountain home or selling your dream home and catch a glimpse into the Colorado lifestyle that's a part of you.